Hey everyone, so uh, yeah, welcome again. It's great to be here. Um, so I'm Radu. Um, I, uh, yeah, I work at FreePillar, uh, and today I'm going to be talking about um, a library called FreeJS, which allows us to <coughs> essentially make uh, hardware accelerated graphics, um, 3D graphics uh, that run natively in the browser, right? So what that means is that um, we can use the video card, right, to perform calculations that a CPU would never be able to do in real time. And uh, <clears throat> they all run without, you know, the users, uh, when they come to your website, they don't have to actually install a live, uh, you know, plugin or anything like that. So it's just JavaScript, which is you know, wonderful. Um, so <coughs> just a few things about me. Uh, I used to, you know, I started uh, my JS, you know, voyage, I guess, at a really small studio. Uh, and we made a lot of uh, multimedia-centered content. We did, um, you know, video games, animation, you know, After Effects, um, you know, pretty much all of it. Uh, we didn't actually use CGS for every project. Um, <coughs> we used uh, a whole lot of Unity CD, for example, which is proprietary game engine. Uh, we used uh, modern software of like CGS Max, but. Most of the time, we came back to CJS because um, it proved the most uh, flexible. It had that balance of, um, you know, hackability. You could easily modify it if you want to. Something you could never really do if you could do it proprietary. And one of the things we started to see in, um, you know, when, when we started hiring new programmers was that uh, very similar to that problem where uh, people sort of start learning, learning React before they you know really proper JavaScript, people started to um, learn about FreeJS and all that without actually knowing what makes a uh, 3D scene, for example, or, or how animation works, right? So this, um, this presentation aims to sort of cover them both, both library and the basics of the 3D. Uh, environment, um, but a very introductory level, right? So some things will be um, abstracted because you know I only have like a half an hour. So <coughs> first of all, what is it? What is FreeJS? So it's uh, an open source uh, GitHub library. It's all JavaScript. Um, the linchpin, you know, is, I think is that it's so easy to use, right? So a lot of big companies, including Apple, just picked it up instantly. Um, because it abstracts draw web, web, WebGL API very well, right? So WebGL API, um, although powerful, is managed by someone else right, um, than WC. It's managed by the Kronos Consortium, which is a non-profit organization. And it's modeled after a very old API um, called OpenGL2 for embedded systems, right? It's meant to run on um, mobile, embedded mobile devices, right? Um, so it abstracts that really well, and it's very, it has a vibrant community. It's um, updated really frequently, so we have 92 revisions in eight years, right? So all the major bugs are gone from it, and it, it keeps getting, uh, you know, more and more um, accessible, right? So, um, yeah, right, what about the browser support? So the browser support is actually looking really good. Um, Obviously, it doesn't work on anything older than you know stuff like um, Internet Explorer 11. Um, but you know, all in all, you're still in the situation that you sort of need to provide some uh, drawback. You can detect if a browser doesn't support WebGL, so you can prepare for that. Maybe prepare a video or something. But it's pretty well supported, right? Um, right. So, um, do I have video? Uh, uh, any audio? Right, so this is um, this is a YouTube video. Let me see. It. Uh, I think I need to set it from here. Uh, which one is it? This one. Let's see. All right, I introduced okay. you, Leonardo. All right, so before, before that, I just wanted to check sound. So this is a really cool video um, done, sponsored by NVIDIA, which is a graphics card uh, manufacturer. 
And they sponsored uh, the Mythbusters to sort of um, explain in a really evocative way what the difference is, you know, architecturally <clears throat> between um, using the CPU to render something and the GPU to render something, right? So without further ado. Okay. In a way that a CPU might do, as a series of discrete actions performed sequentially, one after the other. And then three, two, one. Uh, let me speed it up. Ladies and gentlemen, Leonardo. So yeah, so that was pretty cool, uh, and believe it or not, that is exactly how a GPU works, actually. Uh, it's the same principle, it's really cool that rather than uh, calculating one pixel at a time, it possesses the proper arch hardware architecture to calculate all of them at once. Um, that's not to say that CPU uh, rendering is still not used. Uh, that is still, in fact, very much alive, but we, it's outside of the scope of this talk. The point, the main difference here is that it cannot do uh, real-time animation, which is right what we're talking about today. All right, so um, let's move on to the basics and how 3GS can help us um, do that. So. Uh, Pretty impressive, right? Um, we have a colored square, uh, but believe it or not, this is where um, most of the magic happens. So just getting this inside um, a different environment, like doing it inside, you know, OpenGL or C++ or something like that, would take. So when you're here in C++, you're almost done. I'm not kidding. So setting up your context and starting to render in it is huge. It's a huge thing, right? It's so much more than like six lines of code, right? So while this is not in, as impressive, you will see that we just create something called <coughs> WebGL render, right? And 3GS knows to um, start using our hardware, um, our video card. We set its size, so that's 500 by 500 pixels. We s so this is a method that I just use for a demo. We're not going to use it anymore. But we can set something like a clear color and clear, just like a canvas, you know, we can erase with a color. So just to note, the renderer handles almost everything we did um, to render a scene, right? So the renderer, just like, I guess, the um, React method, uh, the, Rea the render method in React, needs some info, right? So um, just like the method needs JSX, the renderer needs to know two things, right? Um, first, what perspective should we draw from, right? So we need to know where is the camera, where are we in the scene, what, what are we, from where are we looking at? And it uses this structure called the frustum, right? So frustum is, as you can see, uh, it's actually a geometric shape, and it is a pyramid with its top fly stop, right? And why we use um, this shape is because um, the render will use it in order to calculate what it will draw to the screen. So everything inside of the frostum is drawn. Everything outside is not. It's really simple, right? So we can actually customize the frostum quite a lot. So for example, um, we can change its FOV, which stands for field of view, right? So for example, it's now set to 30 degrees, so we can set it to 60 degrees. So the, the FOV is, you know, what percent of the world is currently visible um, measured in degrees, right? In horizontal degrees. So the more FOV you have, the wider the shot gets, right? So used for stuff like panoramic shots, um, and a really low FOV, you know, is used like for zooming in on stuff, right? 
Um, we need to set the aspect ratio, that's pretty self-explanatory, right? So it needs to know um, the ratio of horizontal to vertical pixels, so um, the image is not distorted. And also another cool um, setting is the um, near and far. So what that means is, <coughs> if I'll turn like this, you will notice that um, this pyramid has actually two what are called clipped planes. So I can move the near clip plane further, like this, for example, right? And the far clip plane, um, I guess, closer, like this. And believe it or not, this actually you can actually generate some really interesting effects like this. Um, but all in all, uh, these are all the settings you need for um, creating a camera, perspective camera, right? So now our render actually knows where are we looking at the scene from, right? So that's great. Um, the second and final thing the renderer needs to know is, okay, I know what, where I'm looking at, but what, what exactly am I looking at, right? So um, <coughs> that's why um, the scene exists, right? So you can see we just instantiated on line one. It's a free dot scene. Um, oh, and by the way, this library is completely ES6 compatible, so you can install it via npm, import, whatever you need. So all, we have all that stuff, right? Um, so you'll see um, lines three, four, and five, something really interesting, but we'll actually discuss a bit more later about this. Um, what you need to know is, so we create a geometry, a material, and a cube. Essentially what that means is um, a geometry is something that tells the renderer what shape an object has, right? It's silhouette. Um, its material is dictates its color, right? So I could, for example, um, change the color here, like this, or full white, like so. Um, and it's added to the scene. A scene, actually, if you think about it, you could actually abstract even real life. It is a um, three-dimensional graph, right? It's a Cartesian graph uh, with the world origin 0, 0, 0 being at its center, right? So you see this cube, it's added at 0, 0, 0 with dot position dot set, so that, that's really intuitive, I think. And we can set its y coordinate to two, for example, right? And the scene will automatically respond. Um, so believe it or not, this is actually really powerful. Wherever you see like real time, like in a video game, for example, movement is absolute same principle. Um, things work on a Cartesian coordinate basis, right? X, Y, and Z. So as you can imagine, we can enter any, um, any number here, and we work. Right, so that's the scene. So, just to recap, um, we create something called the render, which takes care of drawing everything to the canvas, right? Um, so, um, the canvas, um, I forgot this part, sorry. Um, so, the render has a DOM element, right? It's a property of the render. That's an actual canvas, you need to attach that. To, to, to your DOM, right? You need a canvas to draw. Um, you create a camera with those parameters, you create a scene with no parameters, and you essentially create, add stuff to the scene, and then you just hit render, right? It's just like, I think it's really striking and similar to something like React, for example. Right? Um, all right, so this is what it looks like. Still, it's fairly unremarkable, I agree, but it, it's better than the last one, right? Um, Right, so now that we have that, um, let's talk about animation, right? So um, animation is um, really interesting. Um, it's an illusion, right? I you probably all know that. Um, very interesting, it is the illusion of motion uh, by means of the rapid succession of sequential images that differ from each other very minimally, right? So back in the day, they used to draw these by hand which is really painful, but um, the render uh, does the exact same thing today, right? So um, <coughs> by painting an image on the canvas at very rapid succession, our brains sort of interpolate them, and um, we get the illusion of animation, right? So <coughs> it sort of works like this. Any, so any interactive 3D experience has this core root inside of it, right? So first of all, we take the user's input. You know, do we have any button presses, did the camera move, stuff like that, right? After we take the user input, we sort of update the scene. So, for example, if 
I don't know if it's a shooting game and you just shot an enemy and it needs to disappear. Uh, the, the scene is updated. And then we render. Right? And we do that as many times as possible per second. Right? And then we, this is a um, recursive function. And we do that using a special browser function called request animation frame. I'm sure you're aware of it. Um, so, <clears throat> also, yeah, so about frame rate. So, if you have any gaming purists here, you know that this is um, a very, very important uh, topic. So, um, not much to say here. Um, the more um, frequent the draw calls are, the more frequent we more frequently we draw something to the canvas, the better our brains uh, interpolate that movement, right? And if we're talking about a <clears throat> interactive experience, then uh, it is crucial that we have a refresh rate as high as possible, probably equal to the maximum number our um, screen can support, right? Because essentially, if it's an interactive experience, if you press a button, right, in that core view, the lower the frame rate is, the more you have to wait until, you know, you see something on the screen, right? And there, the, the longer that wait time is, the your brain will disconnect from it, right? You will lose the so-called conversion, right? So, moving on. So this is in action. You see we're actually using this animation frame. And, and this animation frame takes an argument that um, should be a function. And it's basically asking the browser, okay, so when you have the possible resources, right? And it's really smart, so if it's in a different tab, it won't run. When you have the resources, tell me, and please execute this part, right? And when the browser is ready, it will um, call the function that was passed as an object, right? So we're actually doing some modifications to the rotation um, and the position, right? So we're using math.sign to make the, the keep wobble. And um, it actually, uh, another really cool thing about request animation frame is that it passes you a very high resolution timestamp in milliseconds, right? So you can use that for um, animating stuff. Okay, so yeah, so this is basically about the simulation frame. Um, it takes a callback, it returns an integer that you can use, you can cancel it with using cancel animation frame. Uh, the number of callback, yeah, it's usually 10 per second because that is the most frequent refresh rate you, your users will use. So. There are high refresh rates out there, but they're still kind of, kind of minimal. Um, so yeah, do not use a timeout. This uh, request animation frame, this method has been used especially for animation in the browser. Right? All right, so um, lights. Um, lights are extremely important. Um, so our cubes, right, that we saw until now, um, they had just a flat color, right? Um, however, lights, just like in real life, um, the source of the light will show you how um, an object is shaped, right? So, for example, if I'm standing in a field and the sun is over there, uh, my shadow will go right behind, right? So, we have uh, three types of lights. Um, they are... Um, they aim to mimic the lights we sort of encounter in nature. Um, and obviously you can't talk with, about lights without talking about its shadow. So you can see that um, there are four lines that we need to uh, type in in order to um, tell the renderer we're using shadows. And then after we've created a direction light, which is just a three dot direction one, uh, we, use, we tell it to cast shadow and we, uh, the rest of them, we told them to uh, receive shadows, right? And the, I can actually demonstrate this. So for example, um, right now you'll see when the moon goes behind the earth, it no longer receives a shadow, right? Um, and also you see I created something called the directional light. So, oh, sorry, an, um, an ambient light. So an ambient light um, exists because in nature, um, light is actually generated by a particle called a photon, and it is unique uh, in the natural world. 
because of two things. Um, and this is loosely so if there are any physics blocks out there, I'm sorry, but this is like an extreme generalization. One, they have no mass, right? So they can travel at the maximum uh, speed, which is the speed of light. And um, secondly, yeah, secondly, they travel at the speed of light, which is unique, right, to, to photons. There's nothing else that does that. And these photons, they, what is special about them is that, uh, you know, even more, is that they bounce, right? So they hit something, and they, then they don't remain there, right? They bounce around the room at light speed and until they eventually hit our eyes. And that's really hard to simulate in real time, um, but we have a lot of hacks, such as the ambient Right? So, for example, if I turn on um, a light bulb right there and hold my phone up like this, this part would be lit, correct? But the part that wouldn't be lit would be like a black hole, right? I could still see it even though the light is behind it because light bounces all around the world and hits it eventually, right? So that's, that's sort of the hack we're, we're using for an ambient light. Um, all right, so... Um, and the world is the spotlight, right? Pretty self-explanatory. It has some really cool settings. You created just like the render, right? It's a three-dot spotlight. It has a color and an intensity, so you can bump this up if you uh, feel like it. Um, oh yeah, it's here. Sorry. Yeah, there it is. So you can bump it up. Um, you can control its distance, for example, right? So this is uh, a setting. You can control its angle or its penumbra, which is the gradient that it has from its edge to its uh, center, right? Um, the same thing. We tell the render we want shadows. We specify exactly what we want to cast and what we see, right? Um, very important. Yeah, I forgot to mention these also need to be added to the scene, right? The render has to be aware of these lights, right? And um, the last type of light we have is the point light, right? And this is used to uh, simulate something like um, <clears throat> a light bulb, right? Or maybe you're doing like um, the solar system and the sun is in the middle, right? Again, pretty similar. Um, what's a bit different about this is that we can actually uh, dictate um, it's near and far, right? So now it only goes 10 units. Far, so it doesn't actually reach the walls, right? Like this. All right, so um, recap about lights. Um, first of all, we need to choose a material <clears throat> that is affected by light. We'll get to this. This is actually the final piece of the yeah. presentation. Um, and what's the difference between those three materials? Uh, we create a light, we add light to the scene. And um, we use the shadows. Um, it's important to note that shadows are actually pretty expensive to calculate, so you might, might want to uh, not overuse them, especially if your visitors, <coughs> if your users are in mobile, right? So use them sparsely. Uh, yeah, maps. So <coughs> right up until now, um, our objects, the objects we haven't seen, were. Um, they had a flat color, right? And while that's okay for, I guess, demo purposes, um, if you're, you know, if your object has way more detail, like for example, if I'm, <clears throat> I want to render a person, for example, I can't still have it all in one flat color, right? I mean, I could, but it would be bad, right? And uh, a man named um, <clears throat> Edwin Earl Capnell, um, back in like the 80s, uh, invented um, this notion of maps. Uh, this guy is the founder and current president of Pixar Animation Studios. His uh, contribution to a real-time 3D is, is beyond imagining, so he was a huge, huge contributor. Um, <clears throat> and he had a really simple idea that blew a lot of people's minds back then, which was, how about if we take a picture, right, and then use it as a wrapper onto an object, right? 
For example, uh, I mean, I think this is pretty self-explanatory. Our cube now is not flat color anymore, right? Um, so the calculation is actually mind-blowingly simple, and uh, we just map the pixels from the picture to the pixels to the screen, and use a few uh, a, a simple um, vector map to determine perspective. But essentially, it's so simple and effective and cost-effective from a, a hardware point of view that it blew everyone away, and we're still using it today. Um, so this is, uh, so yeah, after people found out about maps, things got really crazy, right? So people started thinking, how about we have tons of maps, right? And why have only diffuse maps? So a diffuse map is just color, right? It's just flat color. If we, if we had, say, for example, um, if you had, for example, a um, wall, I could use that texture and put it against the wall. It doesn't actually look like a brick wall yet. It sort of looks like um, like a cardboard cutout, I guess. That's because we're all using one map, right? So if I use something called a normal map, then you would see that um, if I set the uh, materials normal map to um, what I used, uh, I won't be using the texture order, but you can use it um, in any way you want, actually. It can be actually an uh, image HTML element if you want. Um, the only th um, thing you need to bear in mind is that um, that normal map needs to be set to <clears throat> an, HTML, an HTML image. That, that's it. And it will just take it from there, right? So this normal map um, gives the illusion of a uh, embossed surface, right? So you'll see that the shadows between the bricks, um, they move along with the light, but it's only an illusion because if you actually look closer, the wall is still flat, right? The GPU is just sampling that map and coloring this wall as if it were uh, way more detailed than it is here, right? Um, if that's not enough, we have something called a disp displacement map, right? And what that does is it segments our geometry and actually does emboss it, which is way more convincing, but way more expensive as well, because we have more triangles, more calculations. Uh, we also have alpha maps. Uh, I'm sure you already know this. So this is just um, a map that is used to um, <coughs> render. It uses this to figure out which part of the plane uh, it should render and which part it shouldn't render. So I think, yeah, so this is the actual vector, the actual map of the plane. And then we just feed it the alpha map and it knows what to cut out. And the general magic behind all these maps is that all of them together, right, as you can see in the code, um, all of them together create a much more convincing effect. So I wouldn't actually, you know, necessarily call this photorealistic or anything. It's not, but it's much better than the cardboard cutout we started out with, at least, right? Um, so yeah, you can see that we have normal maps, we have we have dental geometry, and all that. All right, and this is the final portion. So I'm sort of almost done. Um, so it's about materials, right? So People used maps for the longest time until, here's the thing, right? Real-time rendering and uh, not real-time rendering, the one that's done on the CPU, have always been caught in this clench of death of competition, right? Because offline rendering, as it's called, right? Done via the CPU takes up an enormous amount of time. So rendering something like uh, Pixar's cars, for example, is done in render farms, which are huge computers, like rooms, I'm not even kidding, like this is the 80s level of volume, uh, and they take hours per frame. It's a very excruciating process, but the quality is absolutely mindful, right? Real-time rendering does not have that luxury, it does not have the luxury of time, but we, we tend to cheat way more than that, right? So, this is part of our latest and greatest innovations in the realm of cheating, right? Which is materials. So in order to keep up with the realism 
offered by offline rendering, we sort of enhance the texture, so the, the mapping system, the texture system, to further uh, emulate life, right, real life. So we take, um, people have studied materials individually and very closely, like what is special about wood, right? So the first, um, the first um, sort of breakthrough they had is that in nature, conductive and non-conductive materials are shaded completely differently, right? So metal and plastic, when light hits them, it somehow reacts totally different. And using those physical notions, right, they've managed to um, tell the renderer, right, 3JS renderer in this case, to apply some special rules um, when drawing an object, right? So for example, you can see um, a really reflective object right here. So when light hits it, it automatically bumps it off. Right? You can see that this uh, object, for example, um, if you think about it, has no color. Right? So a mirror, it, it doesn't have color. Right? When you look at it, you only see um, the environment. Right? All photons hit it and went straight to your um, so, for example, uh, wood is not reflective at all, right? Or it's very lit. Right, so taking these um, notions, they actually created um, a few material types, right? The first one is the wireframe material, right? So you can see, again, we create a box geometry. That's just something for this. That's a helper class. If you want to make a box, a quick box for testing. And we create that. 3GS basic material, and its argument takes a color and if it is, it is or not a wireframe. Right? So why I'm showing this is because uh, you can see in the top left side, that is actually the first 3D game ever made. It was made in 1960. Um, this was before they could actually, they had the map to figure out what triangle is in front of what triangle. So right now, we can figure out that out pretty fast, but as you can see, they used wireframe because they didn't, they didn't have the horsepower to do the math, right? Um, then there's the basic material, right? So um, I just made two torus knots. That's what the that chip's called. Um, the blue torus and the orange torus. You see I made uh, two materials, blue mat and orange mat. Uh, and I gave them each color and I add it to the scene. And you can see they are flat shaded, right? So they are lit equally from all uh, areas. Such a material does not exist in real life, right? But it, it was the, one of the first non-wireframe materials to be calculated, and its discovery actually led to uh, the movie Tron, which is actually really <laughs> infamous for the fact that the technology at that point dictated what the movie would look like, right? So a lot of rich people, were in a room and they said, okay, what can we do? People said, well, I have flat colors right now, really. And they said, sure, ship it, right? And if you've seen Tron, um, there's lots of just basic geometry and flat colors, right? Um, then we have the Lambert material. So this was a pretty big breakthrough in real time 3D. This is from uh, Nintendo's N64 console. So People were really blown away by this. Um, it might not seem like much for it today, but just the fact that, for example, Mario's nose has a lit side and a shaded side, it, it was so huge back then. This was lit, there was no other console on the market, right? So, and the fact that it was real time, 3D, it, it was huge, right? And you can see that the, um, the way we create it, right? We create a sphere geometry, a Lambert material that has color, and we create the mesh, just like the cube, right? We give it a geometry and a material. So this is really cheap to calculate, but you can see it has a ton of limitations, right? So essentially, you know, without going too much into detail, it figures out which point in the sphere is in the light, and then smoothly interpolates to the ones that are not. And, you know, this was really cool, again, in like the eight, like, when was this, like, I think like, mid 90s or something like that. Today, it, it just won't cut it. And most of video games in real time today use Fong um, shading. Right? So you can see that now the shading is perfectly circular. It doesn't need to know which points are in the light. 
Um, and what's special about it is, um, you know, sort of funny, a university paper done by a professor called actually Professor Fong, uh, he actually cracked the math on this, but it was sort of unrelated to this, and people picked it up and made the material out of it, and that's sort of why you have it today. Um, so yeah, you can see that it is a circle completely independent of the geometry. And the last thing I want to show you is sort of what the future holds. So this slide, uh, <coughs> this is PBR. So PBR stands for physically based rendering. This is the future of real-time rendering, right? This is actually using um, made using highly advanced data that comes from scientists actually scanning, laser scanning different materials. So you can see we're going really far here, right? Um, laser scanning materials to see how they actually act under different kinds of light, and then reporting that back, right? And um, I'm not sure if this translates actually to the screen, but they are so advanced that, so if you look in this portion, you will see that we can sort of see the sky, and in this portion, we can see a wall, right? That actually translates, so if you look to like these really cool wolves look here, you will see that they're lit in one color here that comes from the sky, and a totally different color here that comes from the wall, right? So this is actually physics, I'm not even kidding, right? This is really, really advanced stuff. Um, What's the downside? So my my Mac is really having a, a really hard time rendering all this. It is the hands down the most advanced but expensive uh, way of drawing something right now. Right, um, and that's it. Thank you. Um, are there any questions? Yeah, th thank you. That's actually a really good question. So, uh, browsers today are smart enough to match the refresh rate of the screen they're displayed on. And there are fairly expensive displays that render at, say, 120 hertz, right? So, we draw, so that's, uh, so for, I think um, re the recent iPad actually draws at 120. And the browser will try and call the transmission frames 120 times every second, right? So as long as your scene is simple enough that you can calculate that, 120 times a second, which is a tall order, trust me. Um, yeah, it's definitely not bottom. It will match uh, the, the display. Mm -hmm. And in your own experience, where is the threshold for performance that you have to have in the browser? Because it's not very Yeah. Yeah. That's that's also a good question, actually. So the frame rate thing is a discussion in itself, right? Um, it's true. Most people, given a 30 hertz display and a 60 hertz display, will have a hard time distinguishing between them. Um, it depends really on the person. So, for example, people with very um, very uh, high um, low reaction time jobs, for example. Like of fighter pilots who actually see a red flash in a series of uh, 300 white flashes in one second. So some people have extreme good vision, right? Um, so yeah, you could probably get away with 30, but you know, the, the real point here is that while the person may not conscientiously pick up on that, <coughs> the brain sort of experience will, right? So for example, in uh, VR, I wrote on VR part, right? And in VR, they recommend you have for a complete, right, so, so really putting people in the sea, right? So making them, the brain leaves there. And that's possible. I made people sick because of what I did, 
because it might seem seriously. So it's terrible. It's terrible. Don't. Uh, anything below 120 will um, not treat the brain, right? It's a subconscious reaction, right? The brain will be way more immersed in the experience, the higher the frame it is, even though you don't technically realize it. Yes? So, is that something that also is Yes. Yes, yes, that's true. So, um, <clears throat> 3GS actually has uh, different renderers, right? So, this was the WebGL renderer that draws uh, on a canvas using the video card. Um, it can also draw um, using um, CSS 3D, right? So, <laughs> yeah, I know, it's actually really interesting when it, when it it really blew my mind the first time I saw it. So this is this website, right? And if we uh, go to examples, um, and we go to CSS, CSS 3D. Um, so this is actually what it does. Uh, it actually applies um, that. Thank you. It actually. Um, distorts uh, divs and applies uh, the illusion of perspective to it, right? So you can watch YouTube on a cube if that's your thing, right? Right? Um, and yeah, it also, so there's a lot of, there are a lot of ways of drawing. So this, for example, you'll see it's way worse and um, has much, worse frame rate because in this software mode what we're doing every frame is filling a huge array right with one element in the, uh, three elements in that array corresponding to each pixel right the red green and blue and then sending that and drawing that to the canvas every frame so that's extremely inefficient but it's a good fallback if the person doesn't support webgl right they have no browser and stuff like that right so yeah. So this is also very cool too. The act of uh, notion of translucency. There's a marble, uh, not marble, a jade a rabbit, and light penetrates it. Believe it. Yeah. Great. <laughs> right. Uh, there's not. So, Fugis angles uh, only in just one view. There is, however, a physics engine called Bullet, uh, Bullet, uh, Bullet or Ammo, I forget. And they are sort of sister libraries. So they work excellent together. Um, and they can be used really, really well together. Right? Um, so, uh, an object from Ammo could be added to a C from C and vice versa. It's completely interoperable. Yes. So, this people started using the WebAssembly? Nice. Uh, not yet. However, um, it's a no-brainer, right? So, I'm sure they're working on it. They have like 300 or something contributors. Someone is bound to do this. Uh, it's a no-brainer. This is a very high-performance, critical uh, domain. We could really use WebAssembly. Um, we're actually at the cusp of uh, the advent of WebGL 2. It has terrible problem support. It's way better, but like only some nightly versions, hipster versions, support it. So nothing, nothing yet. Right? But yeah, I, I'm also really hyped. That's, that's also a really good question. So, the GPU, so because of the stagnation of CPUs, right, recently, compared at least to the massive, massive evolution of GPUs, people have started using parallel processing for just number crunching, for hard math. 
And uh, yeah, this is no exception. There are, so for example, um, deep learning, machine learning uses the GPU as well, right? So it uses tensors mapped to uh, what could be essentially pixels. It's completely abstract, it doesn't matter. But yeah, you don't actually need a canvas. And if you just crunch raw math and then extract it from memory, you can totally do that. So it's not, it's, it's a very, very valuable use case. Sorry? Absolutely. I've actually seen a script attached to the favicon, the SVG favicon of a site that mines Bitcoin, which is like the most 2018 thing I've seen in my life. You know, we need to block icons now. <laughs> Seriously, it's insane. Yeah, and how much do you mind, you know? Anyway. Okay. Um, thank you very much. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Awkward. Uh, so, 3GS is indeed really high level. Um, I think raw WebGL would satisfy all your low level needs. I do not. So, this, we're talking about API that does manually bind numbers to memory. Kind of thing, right? So, this is as low as you can realistically expect in the browser. Um, if that is not enough for you, um, there is a um, so people, people at Kronos are striving to go even lower, so really uh, new video cards have uh, a new API that does not require drivers at all called Vulkan, and it needs about 600 lines of code to put one triangle on the screen, it's crazy. And uh, they are actually uh, debating um, Web Vulkan, which is codenamed Obsidian, um, and if that actually happens, I'm sure that I mean, I got you, right? So that is <laughs> that is as low as you can realistically hope in like computers, period, right? So 600 lines for a triangle, right? It's it's crazy. That's why we Yeah. Yeah, definitely. So if that's your thing, just wait. No. <laughs> it's like around the corner. So, so <laughs> yeah. Um, that's a good question. So, <clears throat> yes and no. Um, you could theoretically use it to. Um, <clears throat> yes. <laughs> So, um, a voxel is a relatively new notion. It is uh, essentially a 3D pixel, right? Um, and they exist, so for example, if I had a world made out of voxels, um, I would <clears throat> cover my scene in an invisible 3D grid, for example, right? And that grid would be as small or as large as I want my simulation to be. And those voxels can be via some really clever al algorithms can be used for simulating really, really hardcore stuff like <coughs> fluid dynamics, for example, right? So um, I can simulate something like water really well, like really well, right? Um, just by cleverly deducing which cells in my scene are filled and which are not, right? And yes, if you set up this system, three will sort of render it for you Right, it will be able to extrapolate that. So, for example, uh, there's this example of something called the metaballs, which everyone calls meatballs, obviously. Uh, if it's meat, it's not meat. It's not meat. Um, yeah. So I. Forgot the name. That's the official term. Um, yeah. So this is yeah. This is the sort of the notion, right? I'm just filling um, invisible squares in my <clears throat> in my scene, right? 
And while it may not look like much, it's extremely powerful for things like uh, physics simulations, right? Um, yeah, so, oh, the last thing I want to mention is, so this is, no, it's not. The example's taking me right now, never mind. Um, but yeah, you could, you could theoretically do voxels easily. Okay. Thank you very much.